Hello, everyone. This is Tom Connolly, President and Chief Investment Officer at First and Capital Management, Inc. Uh, today, I'd like to have a little bit of time to talk about the banking crisis that has started uh, midweek last week and has come to engulf, as, as, as I speak, at least three banks um, and uh, scaring a lot of bank customers and depositors and investors as well. So I'd like to spend a few minutes on on, on this um, and talk about what it might, uh, how it might unfold and impact markets in the future uh, for a very brief time. So uh, bank runs are as old as banking. The idea with banks is they take deposits and capital from uh, uh, customers like you and investors, and then they lend that money out in, or invest it out in the marketplaces. Now, uh, for depositors, uh, it's anticipated that at any point in time, only a few people will need liquidity or need to uh, move funds in and out of their bank account. And therefore, the bulk of the deposits in the invested capital can remain invested in longer term things, such as uh, investing in businesses or homes or uh, helping people buy homes or other uh, types of activities like that that are longer term in nature than the needs of the depositors. So there's kind of a, uh, uh, a liquidity difference and timing difference, and the bank uses that um, to make their profits. The, in, the money they make from making these loans and investments uh, is greater than what they pay depositors, and that's how the system works. So when there is a demand in the short run for depositors uh, cash, in other words, depositors, customers of the bank want their money back quick and a lot of it all at the same time, that is a bank run. And so that may, uh, there may be more demand for short-term cash by depositors than what's available at the bank. And under those circumstances, then the bank has to start liquidating assets. And that's, that's where we are at this point in time. So last week, uh, Silvergate on Wednesday uh, uh, went in, uh, stopped doing business. Um, Silicon Valley Bank went into receivership the other day uh, and Signature uh, over the last night. Um, Silicon Valley Bank was to closely tied to the uh, venture capital uh, world in Silicon Valley, and Signature Bank had a lot of crypto uh, customers in its um, uh, uh, base of depositors and uh, investors. So um, the problem with Silicon Valley Bank, which is the bank of, of which we know most about right now, is that the, the uh, genesis of this event was really in the uh, COVID space when uh, there was a lot of response for the COVID crisis. The government released a lot of liquidity out in the environment. Uh, that caused investment, in our opinion, investment bubbles in the venture capital space, private, uh, private equity space, uh, technology space, and crypto space. And as in the uh, from 2020 to 2022, when uh, or through 2021, especially when the, those markets took off, multiples expanded, uh, IPOs were sold, people had proceeds, venture capital deals were done, people had proceeds, they put that money into Silicon Valley Bank. So its assets grew from about 55 billion to 186 billion in two years. So what does the bank do? Well, can it make a medium-sized bank like that make loans for $135 billion over the space of two years? Most likely not. And so what they did is they took $80 billion of these new deposits and invested them in the bond market. So they purchased very safe government-backed mortgage-backed securities um, in the marketplace, but they did it at, the, at a time when interest rates were at an all-time low. So if you recall investment fundamentals, if interest rates go up, the value of bonds go down and vice versa. If interest rates go down, the value of bonds goes up. So, but most of um, Silicon Valley Bank's bond buying was done at the absolute lowest point 
in, uh, in the interest mar uh, rate market. So um, subsequently, interest rates have moved up, so their bonds are worth less. Uh, so what difference does that make? Well, Silicon Valley had a lot of people come to them, a rush demanding liquidity from their on their deposits, and they ran out of cash or liquid investments to meet those obligations, so they had to start selling these bonds, which had declined in market value because interest rates went up. And they declined to such a degree that the uh, shareholder equity was basically gone, which is when the government decided to act. So they really made, um, really made three big mistakes, uh, reaching for yield, uh, and they had made the investment in the bonds that they couldn't have timed it worse from an interest rate perspective. Um, it doesn't seem like Silicon Valley Bank had a really good handle on their clients' cash needs. Um, and in the minute that confidence breaks and the customers of the bank out there become worried that they'll be able to get their cash, more and more call trying to get their cash out. And that was how, how the bank run uh, started. Um, and then we had a, a, a the new technology uh, contributed to it. We don't have a handle exactly on the contribution, but you can imagine now you can go on the internet with a few clicks of a button, move cash from your bank to another place uh, that where you need the cash, and it's just almost instantaneous uh, for electronically. Um, so everything can happen really quick compared to 10, 20 years ago. And then you had out in social media, um, a lot of people talking out there and amplifying the fear and concern. Some pretty big names, you know, David Ackman, Peter Thiel, David Sachs were all influential in different uh, eco financial ecosystems out there fanning the flames in, um, in the social market arena. Uh, so uh, all these things came together, a, a crush of demand up for short-term cash from the bank which they couldn't meet in a short period of time. They had to sell assets, which had declined. They weren't allowed to hold them to maturity. They had to sell them before maturity, so there were losses realized, and the government, when that reached a certain point, the government shut them down. Um, old phenomenon, bank runs, kind of with some new flavor in it uh, today. So what did the government stepped in, they put uh, the bank into receivership, and then they took some actions yesterday um, the, the Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and the FDIC made two major policy announcements. And the idea here is to provide liquidity to the banks that may be suffering these short-term funding needs where people are lining up to get their cash now, and, the, and if the banks don't have enough liquidity to provide it, the, federal, the, the government is, is trying to provide that liquidity uh, temporarily to shore up that need. And then. Uh, if the liquidity is present and people know that it's the government's backing the banks uh, uh, for insured deposits especially, that'll shore up confidence and people won't be so concerned and the run bank runs will hopefully stop. So that's the deal. So what did they do? Well, they provided a systemic risk exception for Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, which basically provides a, a backing for uninsured deposits using the FDIC insurance fund. So if you're, let's say you're a big company and you have your deposits at the bank to meet payroll and other operating expenses, and uh, it's more, your company is a reasonable size, so it's way more than the FDIC insur insurance will cover, um, but you need the money liquid so you can do payroll and, and uh, meet other obligations. Um, the FDIC said, well, we will, we will uh, back those uninsured deposits uh, regardless of what happens to the bank. And that money is coming out of the FDIC insurance fund. Uh, so this is to some folks an important point because that fund is funded by banks, not the taxpayers. So this is definitely a bailout, but um, because the government's intervening to support business functions of banks. Um, but uh, as far as direct taxpayer cash being used, not the case uh, so far because the uh, insurance fund backing is, is, is funded by banks, not the taxpayers. Um, and then they also established the bank term funding program, the BTFP. So you remember during uh, the great financial crisis and then again, COVID, there were a lot of these 
facility like TARP, if you remember, and other facilities set up with these acronyms. The, this, uh, the one set up today is the BTFP, and what that will do is allow advances of up to one year to any uh, federally insured bank eligible for discount window access. So in other words, they can take those bonds um, that I mentioned before that had declined in value a little bit, and instead of selling them at a loss, they can present them at the discount window and the uh, um, Treasury and the Fed will advance uh, funds at par, not at a loss, against those securities to the bank so it can temp meet these temporary funding needs uh, from uh, concerned clients. So these are two really big actions taken in, in, in a matter of days. And in, in, in our view, it should, it should stop most of the problems here uh, with the bank. So what are the long-term implications? Well, there's really no concern for you if you're working with a bank and your deposits are under 250,000, which is below the, the FDIC insurance limit. Um, if you have more than that in, in cash, you can, uh, there are other vehicles you can use, direct treasury securities, or you can open multiple accounts with different registrations and each account would get a, a 250K um, uh, uh, insurance allotment and, and you'll be fine. Um, so for most of the people on this call, this is really not an issue. In my opinion, it's a bank run. They tip bank runs typically don't last that long. And the government has acted decisively uh, to stop the uh, underlying motivations uh, for the bank run. I can tell you uh, the government will not let the payment system fail really under any circumstances. The pay by the payment system, I mean out there, the circulatory system and the beating heart of our, our financial system and our way of life uh, needs to have money flow to people to make uh, meet obligations, make payrolls, pay bills. Um, that will not be allowed to fail. The government will do whatever it has to do. Uh, however, with respect to supporting banks and investors and shareholders and bondholders, that's a different story for a bank investor uh, I wouldn't expect government bailouts this time around, um, like we basically saw during the great financial uh, crisis. Um, another thing that's going to happen as a result of this is interest rate increases are being called into question. You know, the, the next Fed meeting, people were anticipating a 50% increase in some 25, uh, I'm sorry, 50 uh, basis point increases and 25 basis point increases after that for a while. Um, the, all that's called into question. Uh, because the interest rate increase is one of the stressors that has caused this problem. So the government knows that uh, maintaining depositor comfort is essential in the long run. Another consequence of this is the big banks are being perceived as, as safer. Uh, deposits uh, anecdotally seem to be flowing into them, which, you know, make big banks get bigger, too big to fail, may increase the systemic risk in the long run. Who knows? We'll see. But for now, in the short run, um, the government's taken decisive action uh, to protect the little guy, the investor, or the person banking or the small business who needs the liquidity to run their business. So the biggest problems, in our view, have been, uh, have been uh, solved. So if you have any questions on anything we've said today or want to talk to anybody uh, adversant further on any of these issues, which, by the way, are being updated daily. Uh, we're happy to take those calls and have those discussions. So thank you so much for your time today, and I uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. Bye-bye.